Uh, Keith Newland is <coughs> not only a good friend, but Keith Newland is a wonderful uh, mentor to anyone who has ever expressed interest in the, the, in the life and times of Hamlin Garland. He has written the definitive Garland biography, which was published in 2008, and Keith has been um, a, a, a continual source of both questions and answers um, about Garland's life and times, specifically in my case, Garland's life and times in Osage, Iowa. Ladies and gentlemen, it's with a great sense of pleasure and respect I bring to you the world's foremost Hamlin Garland scholar. I, anybody else want to buy for that title? There? Okay, so I can say the world's foremost Hamlin Garland scholar, my friend and a friend of Mitchell County, Keith Newman. Some illustrations by John, photographs of Hamlin Garland's Iowa. Uh, it is going to be a large format coffee table type book. Um, and I hope uh, something will be interested in. But uh, <coughs> I'm here, I, I, I mentioned coming here because we need to coordinate uh, what we're doing and hope we're on the same expectations. And Kurt asked if I'd be interested in saying something and to the gathering. And I said, Are you kidding? Of course. <laughs> well, do I have a chance? There are more people here than usually. <laughs> so I'm delighted to, uh, to come here, and uh, it's refreshing to see so many people. And so when I was thinking about what to talk about, I didn't want to just trot out and summarize Hamilton's biography, so instead I thought I'd talk about a new project that I've just finished, and this is a, another Garland Connected book published by the University of Iowa Press, first time Iowa has actually published anything by Garland, way overdue. Uh, but this is a book called Garland in His Own Time. It's part of a Writers in Their Own Time series, and the subtitle is very long, and I finally got smart enough to write it down so I remember it, because it's very long, but it tells you exactly what the book is about. Okay? It's Garland in His Own Time, a biographical chronicle of his life drawn from recollections, interviews, and memoirs by family, friends, and associates. It's a long title, isn't it? <laughs> but all the books in the series have that same subtitle. Okay? But that is what it is. So what I just finished collecting is uh, uh, a number of uh, recollections of what Garland was really like, as opposed to what you let people see. And what was interesting in this project is I think nearly half of them are unpublished because they exist only in an archive. And later on, you'll, you'll see how that came about. So um, you are about to hear what no one else in the world has ever heard. Um, and um, I hope it's worthwhile. I find it interesting and hope you do too. So before I get to what um, how Garland was seen by his contemporaries, I thought, because I've learned through bitter experience that I can't presume that everyone knows who Hamlin Garland is, um, that I would give a fairly brief summary of his life so that some of these comments will be in context. Okay, so, although Garland uh, grew up in Osage, he was actually born in West Salem, Wisconsin, in 1860. When he was eight, he moved to the first of four Iowa farms. Uh, his picture of him was 12. And uh, that, you know, he, he, the typical prairie youth of, um, plowing and so forth. This is his house, which is five miles from here, three or four, three or four miles from here. That's still standing, a photo from his time, I don't know when it was precisely his day. 
Coppin going to school, and this is the Garland School that used to be on the corner of his farm that's long since been demolished. And uh, the usual boyhood pursuits. His brother Franklin uh, remembered that during the years from 14 to 17 of Hamlin's life, we both belonged to a baseball team composed of farm boys. Hamlin was our star pitcher and was a good one. He threw the curves and had one particularly effective sinker that had the big boys swinging wildly and missing. He was so effective that we beat the county seat team more often than they did us. I played short in the lineup, but was pretty light to be in my service. Also during these years, this was while he was attending Cedar Valley Seminary. This is a photo by John. Uh, he was reading Shakespeare and other highbrow works, which he would tell me about during his weekend visits at home. How's the volume back there? Better. Better? Thank you. Um, this is a photo of uh, Franklin and Hamlin about the time of uh, Hamlin's graduation from the Cedar Valley Seminary. Uh, the sword fights in Shakespeare made a great hit with both of us, so we fashioned broadswords out of some tough Elmer, elm timber we had. Then we engaged in very lively fights, though probably not very expert, but we had loads of fun at it. So, in 1881, he graduated from the Cedar Valley Seminary. This is uh, Hamlin here. Uh, worked a number of odd jobs and taught in the Midwest before taking up a homestead claim what is now South Dakota. It was Dakota Territory then. This is a, an ad that appeared about the time that um, uh, the Garlands moved uh, to Homestead in South Dakota. And uh, you can't read it in the text, but down around here, the text says, the Indians have been removed and the land is available. So uh, the Garlands moved up there and uh, eventually settled in this house. And Garland has written on this Ordway, Dakota, the house with, in which Maine traveled Rhodes was born. 1887 is when he uh, inscribed this. Fellow Dakota homesteader, Edwin Torrey, who had the homestead next door to, to Hamlin, recalled that while Franklin was very popular, Hamlin, on the other hand, could have lived in the community for 50 years, and no one would have thought of calling him Ham to his face. There were, of course, misunderstandings on both sides. One of the things that I've discovered in these reminiscences is many people commented on Hamlin's reserve and uh, forbidding exterior. He moved to Boston in 1884 and taught at the Boston School of Oratory while studying and learning to be a writer. In 1891, he had his first success, Main Traveled Roads, a collection of six Mississippi Valley stories, this area was then called. This is a, a copy of the first edition of that book. Um, while he uh, was writing stories, he was publishing a number of articles in the nation's magazines campaigning for realism, and that riles the, the nation's press and prompted this uh, illustration from a book called Arthur's Author's Readings. And uh, this is Garland in a typical lecturing pose, and the text at the bottom says, contemplating murder the murder of a romanticist, it may be. <laughs> Yours with due respect, Hamlin Garland. And this is a time of when the realists were saying romanticism was a bad form of literature, realism was a better, more American form. <coughs> uh, in 1898, he joins the stampede to the Klondike, and he goes not to pan gold, but to listen to stories. He's looking for new literary material. He's tired of writing about farms, and he wants to change his subject. So this is a uh, photo of him at his camp um, in his typical pose of taking notes in a notebook with a notebook on his knee and a stub pencil, and which goes a long way to explain his horrible handwriting. Uh, here he is, reading or writing, it's hard to tell, but apparently the mosquitoes were ferocious. Okay. He goes to the Klondike with uh, his boyhood friend, Burton Babcock, who had a neighboring farm. And here is a photo of Burton cooking, okay? again, with the mosquito netting. Um, and still in camp. And finally, he mines the results of experiences into a book called The Trail of the Gold Seekers, a record in prose and verse, which is a, an account to travel for. 
uh, at, at 1899, he is now 39 years old, he decides he's uh, tired of being a bachelor and uh, wants to get married. And he meets uh, Zulani Taft in 1893. She is a sculptor and uh, he uh, at the World's Columbian Exposition and uh, falls in love and has a long campaign of wooing and finally persuades her to marry him. He uh, has uh, two daughters, uh, Mary Isabel, the taller one, Constance, the shorter, born in 1903, 1907. And uh, finally, uh, he after not achieving much financial success with his realistic fiction, he starts writing novels about the uh, Mountain West in the form of romance and uh, achieves finally some financial success. And the first of the uh, real financially lucrative one is The Captain of the Grey Horse Troop in uh, 1902, followed by Hesper in 1903. And he's basically doing a book a year until um, uh, 1970. But by the age of 50, this is 1910, he's, he's feeling pretty written out. He's been publishing these romances one a year, it's you know, boy meets girl, and as he says to a friend, by the time he's 50, you know, love affairs seem to be kind of old, boring stuff. I mean, he reinvents himself as an autobiographer, and it's a long and painful story, which I talk about in biography, um, but he uh, publishes uh, The Son of the Middle Border in 1914 in uh, Collier's Magazine, serialized in installments, and then like in book form in 1917, and this becomes a critical and financial success. Uh, the, the following uh, a couple of years later, 1921, he does The Daughter of the Middle Border, which uh, receives the uh, Pulitzer Prize for autobiography, and uh, does two more sequels about his family saga, uh, Back to Earth's Middle Border, Trailmakers in Middle Border, and then he tells it all over again in four more volumes, <laughs> with literary reminiscences of people he knew. And then finally, he moves to Hollywood in 1930 to be with his daughters who both moved there. And uh, the last 10 years, the picture of Zulmi, Hamlin, uh, somewhere in the 30s, I'm not sure when, um, and uh, uh, grappling with issues of old age and trying to age with dignity. And he dies in uh, uh, March 1940 at age 79. Okay, so I'm going to, uh, do some reading from the introduction to this book, Carlin in His Own Time, and I've augmented that introduction with some quotations from the reminiscences so we can, uh, we can hear what people thought. So, Carlin wrote eight bi autobiographies in two series, totaling more than 3,800 pages. So one wonders, what more can we learn from a collection of reminiscences that Carlin didn't already tell us? All autobiographers construct an image of themselves, and Garland is particularly noteworthy in that he constructed a public myth in middle border books in which his family stood as an exemplar of the prairie settler and himself as a mid representative Midwest. In these books, he recounts his own successes and failures against the backdrop of a prairie youth pulling himself up by the bootstraps to achieve international prominence. While Garland was frank in admitting his professional limitations, of necessity, he excluded elements of his life that didn't fit the myth he was constructing. And like most people, he lacked sufficient distance from events to evaluate his achievements objectively. Absent also is any awareness of the effect of his strong personality upon others. Garland in his own time presents candid portraits of Garland at various points in his long career without the admissions, obfuscations, or myth-making of his autobiographies. For example, <coughs> In A Daughter of the Middle Border, Garland depicts his courtship of Zulami Taft, here she is in 1899, the year they got married, from the point of view of a man, mindful of his own limitations, who nevertheless can't believe that a charming, attractive, and talented artist would want to marry him. I was perfectly well aware that as a husband, I could, would prove neither lovely nor joyous, he confessed. This is a, a Daughter of the Middle Border. I was perfectly, uh, my temper was not habitually cheerful, like most writers, I was self-absorbed, filled with a sense of the importance of my literary designs. Frank, though he is, in acknowledging his own limitations, Garland only tells part of the story. His daughter, Isabel Garland Ward, since after she's grown up and married, later recalled, Zulami Taft was not in love with Hamlin Garland when she married him. She had numerous admirers, 
The father was frank and explained the difficulty he had persuading the lovely young artist to accept him. Mother said she had admired Hamlin, liked him, but love as a physical passion had no part of it. I don't know quite why I did it, she said with a half smile, lying back on the pillows in a darkened room where I sat by her bedside. She has Parkinson's disease when she's telling her daughter about this. Except he was handsome, distinguished, much talked about, and my brother Laredo Taft liked him. Laredo Taft was Carlin's close friend and a sculptor. Here he is at the Columbia next to this room. Omitted also from this public myth is any mention of Zulamy's affair in the early years of marriage that almost destroyed it. As Isabel concludes, once I heard mother's confession, many things about my father became clear to me. He was a proud, self-centered man. It must have turned his world to dust and ashes. One quality of his personality that Carl was either blind to or chose to omit from the public record was his seriousness and patience with others' limitations and sensitivity to criticism, which those who knew him best often described as egotism or humorlessness. Thus, the Chicago journalist Robert Burns Peaty, who knew him in 1892, recalled that, we saw Garland pass through several stages of his career. We saw him first as a radical, a rather vague and wild one with a hatred of evening dress. He was very canny when it came to money, although he had begun to accumulate a good deal. When Garland, Garland married Zulamy Taft, Rayla's sister, she saw to it that he developed some of the social amenities. She bought him a dress suit, and he tamely wore it to dinners in the opera. Even went to Shakespearean plays, though in his book, Crumbling Idols, he had said that Shakespeare was a dead duck. We saw Garland become so inflated with the praise of Howells, it's William Dean Howells, whom didn't that kindly man praise, that he assumed the appearance of Jove and the finality of judgment of Dr. Johnson. We saw him gradually shake off his political heresies and take the side of the reactionaries. So dense was his egotism, then when his closest friend, Henry Blake Fuller, cruelly satirized him in a story, he inquired who Fuller meant. And it's a story under uh, the skylights. Or, excuse me, the downfall of Abner Joyce in the volume. Albert Hubbard, delighted in pointing out the spectacle of, quote, Ham Garland's unselfish devotion to the ego projected by his own literary consciousness in the pages of his magazine, a satiric commentary, The Philistine, and here's an illustration from the magazine. Garland's novels are hot stuff, Ham Garland brass band, and blows his own horn. <laughs> Wearing a cowboy suit. And even Charles Fletcher Lummis, the editor of Out West magazine, who had become a good friend, once remarked, Hamlin Garland is a worthy young man and a talented writer who has already been laughed at probably more than he deserves. Lacking the sense of humor himself, he naturally provokes the smiles of those who have it, even while the respect is astonishing for seriousness. At the time Garland <coughs> provoked these comments, he was in the midst of an often strident campaign on behalf of American realism, in which he flooded the magazine with a number of articles, each more vociferous than the last, deriding the reliance upon Eastern standards and arguing for the ascendancy of the West. When he collected these essays in his literary manifesto, Crumbling Idols, critics were quick to pounce. All that Mr. Garland says of the virtues of originality and truth to nature is but the thousand repetition of propositions that are dangerously near to platitudes for any well-read person, claimed the reviewer for the literary world. Another observed that the essays were a trifle hysterical, and the independent opined that Mr. Garland's egotism is not disagreeable, it does not excite a perverse spirit of opposition. We are compelled to accept it in the same spirit that would control us were a big, hearty, well-fed, uneducated Western plowboy to demand recognition as president of Harvard College or professor of Greek at Yale. His articles and his personality prompted both satire and parody in the form of caricatures in the magazines. So here's one from the Chicago Winter Ocean. The uh, text on the sign says, points to the main traveled road. So as Garland is a farmer, in 1907, when he's writing his Western romances, he's now writing a fucking bronco. Yet the same quality of idealistic vehemence could also prompt admiration. Thus, William Dean Howells, 
who was also the target of negative press would remember. I suppose we were friends in the beginning and never foes, because he had <coughs> convictions too, and they were flatteringly like mine. When we first met 20 years ago or more, in a pleasant suburb of Boston, there was nothing but common ground between us, and our convictions played over it together as freely and affectionately as if they had been fancies. William Dean Howells at this time was the foremost American man of letters, who was the editor of a number of magazines, who controlled the, the reading fate of many writers by deciding whether to publish them, and uh, he would also be writing editorials uh, about them to promote them. Joseph E. Chamberlain of the Boston Evening Transcript, the newspaper that published Garland's earliest work, remembered that an appearance in the 1880s, it was Garland 1887, Garland was a certain man, was a man, a young man of certain singularities but of great beauty. He was a medium height, a supple figure with abundant brown hair, and wore a rather long brown beard that gave him a sort of apostolic appearance. His grave, meditative manner heightened this apostolic effect. He would have made an excellent model for John, the beloved disciple. I doubt if ever Garland has been as serious in his life as he was in 1887, or if he ever will be again. He had, as he has now, a rather high-pitched, very clear voice in which he spoke with due western regard for the R's in that broad, cadence way that seems to have been developed in the voices that ring over the rolling prairies. He lifted up his voice freely in defense of certain theories and causes that were not popular in Boston. He was like Garrison. He would not equivocate or compromise or deny anything that he really believed in. And Benjamin Orange Flower, the publisher of the Arena magazine and the editor who more than any other gave Garland his start, he published Garland's first fiction and first essays and really put him on the map. Flower cherished the memory of many happy hours spent with him. Flower had written to Garland in April 1890, I notice you have seemed to suppress your thoughts in two or three instances and have erased some lines from your story. In writing for the Arena, either stories or essays, I wish you always to feel yourself thoroughly free to express any opinions you desire or to send home any lessons which you feel should be impressed upon the people. I, for one, do not believe in mincing matters when we are dealing with the great wrongs and evils of the day and the pitiful conditions of society, and I do not wish you to feel the writing for the read at any time the slightest constraint. Garland had met a writer's dream and editor who had published virtually anything he wrote, and he did. Still others prefer to remember Garland's generosity to those just starting out of the writing game. Suddenly, out of seeming nowhere, came a letter from a stranger, though I'd heard much of him. Remember Booth Tarkington, referring to Garland's favorable reader's report on his first novel, The Gentleman from Indiana, that inaugurated a career that would include two Pulitzer Prizes. A magazine editor had handed Garland a long manuscript of mine, and the letter began with four dumbfounding words that changed everything for me. You are a novelist. I couldn't imagine anybody saying such a thing. The last of all, could have I believed that an accredited novelist would ever say it, but after I came to know Hamlin Garland, I found that nothing was more typical of him than his stopping work to write such a letter to a groping, unknown youth, dismally mystified about himself in the art of writing. <clears throat> it is impossible to think of Garland without thinking of his kindness, the greatness of heart that was in all of his work and all of his life. The prolific novelist Kathleen Norris, who was married to Charles Norris, the brother of Frank Norris, the novelist, who was also a good girl and friend, remembered Garland's words of encouragement at the outset of her career. She writes, a simple, you have something precious, Dickens had, keep on, left her stunned with ecstasy. And the main writer, Gladys Hasty Carroll, meeting Garland in 1933 and during a film adaptation of her novel, As the Earth Turns, recalled that his presence was a tonic. I came away from him with what I hope is a fixed conviction that life is beautiful and important and that whatever is written about it should be equally so. And Garland Griever, unusual name, Garland Griever, but so it is, an English professor at the University of Southern California, recalled Garland's patient encouragement of students. He often asked who among the students showed promise of creative achievement in writing. He asked that such students be brought to his home. He discussed with them the problems of authorship. 
He exhorted them to revise what they wrote and then revise again and again until they captured the exact meaning to precise emotional nuance. Nothing pleased them better than to confer face to face with talented and eager young writers. Carlin's professional career spanned 55 years, a period in which he published 47 books and hundreds of magazine articles. But it was also a period that saw much change in the American literary scene. When he published his first story in 1885, realism was just then becoming a dominant genre. He would mine the veins of realism until 1916, when he published his last book of fiction, the story collection, Day of the High Trails. But he would also witness the rise and then ascendancy of modernism while he was composing his autobiographies. He did not react well to it. In letters, essays, and conversations, he derided modernist subjects as pornography and the writing methods as journalistic. As a member of the 1921 Pulitzer Prize for Drama, he lobbied against awarding the prize to Eugene O'Neill's Anna Christie, a play about a prostitute, explaining in a letter to the jury chair that it seems to me we have had too much pornographic literature this year. The Pulitzer Prize should not add to its vogue, I hate the whole school, which is essentially un-American. Its writers are, in many cases, for revenue only. And Anna Christie did get the Pulitzer Prize. His younger commentaries, excuse me, his younger contemporaries commented on Garland's blindness to the innovations of the modernists. These are people like Hemingway and Faulkner. Gerald. As, as, as fellow Wisconsin novelist and writer August Derelift remembered, I felt that in some ways he seemed to be a Puritan. Not trim or prudish, no, but a trifle puritanical. Even as he fondly remembered Garland's encouragement, he encouraged me to continue writing about my native milieu, seconding Zona Gale and this encouragement, which was so important to a writer like myself, isolated in provincial mid America in the 1930s with very few contacts. Others profited by his immense store, that's Garland's immense store, of personal recollection of writers that have now become the subjects of books about American literature. Fred Lewis Patti, for example, a professor of American literature at Pennsylvania State College, now Penn State University, first met Garland in January 1915, when he interviewed Garland about his role in the development of realistic fiction in the 1890s. He had written to him a month earlier to test the thesis of his book, A History of American Literature Since 1870. This is a landmark book in the field. And the thesis he writes in his letter is, after the war, a new spirit came over America, a new national spirit, and it swept away the atmosphere to which the mid-century school viewed literature. He queried him about the writers who influenced his early years. But when he met Garland, it was in 1916, Patty later remembered, I found him very self-centered and domineering. Mr. Ellsworth, president of the Century Publishing Company, told me once he considered him to be the leading American jackass. <laughs> Ridiculous, of course, but anyone who's ever worked with him will tell some such story. He was a member of a small committee once. It was to meet at a designated hour to award a prize. He came an hour late, and his explanation was, a little girl came to me for an autograph just as I was starting. I wrote it and then sat and talked to her. I would be cheating her of a valuable experience not to stay and talk. She will remember it as long as she lives how Hamlin Garland once talked to her for an hour. <laughs> In his final decade, Garland moved to Hollywood to be near his daughters. Uh, we have uh, Constance, born in 1907, her son John, and Mary Isabel. Right. Uh, and the relocation exacted a toll on his spirits as increasingly he felt more and more distant, literally and metaphorically, from the clubs and literary talk of New York that had sustained him. He became quite depressed, and his letters amply revealed his sense of disappointment in, as he believed, not living up to his early promise. His good friend, Harold Latham, his editor at Macmillan, recalled, although Garland published a good many books after his son in the middle border, he never again enjoyed the popularity that came with this work. This fact embittered him. He felt that some of his later writings were just as significant as their well-known predecessors, and he tended to resent the indifference with which the younger critics treated him. Many a time, he said to me sadly, it's a new and different crowd now running the show, and to these critics, I have outlived my time. Carlin was also a highly sensitive man. He could be, and often was, deeply hurt by criticism. 
Along with this, his later years were colored by that sense of bitterness to which I have referred. He would forget the great successes that had been his, successes greater than those which come to most authors, and worry about the fact that his later work did not have wide popularity. This brooding on the growing indifference of the public saddened his final years. I like to remember him as he was that brisk October night when we hit the Antiora Trail, near his home in the Catskills. A rugged, sun border border, as yet untroubled by problems of recognition and appreciation that were to cloud his later days and looking ahead to the future with confidence. One of my favorite anecdotes describes Zulamy's effort to distract her husband from his depression. Noted Arctic explorer, Viv Halmier Stephenson, remembered Zulamy's skillful interception of Garland's fan mail. Stephenson writes, spending a weekend with the Lathams, I remember particularly a luncheon where Zulamy Garland was holding forth on Hamlin's relation to his fan mail. According to her version of that afternoon, a crest of appreciative letters was around five a week. If there were more, Hamlin started complaining that readers of books they liked did not commonly realize that showering an author with letters would decrease both the quality and quantity of his future output, for it took time and was distracting to have to compose responsive replies to the kindliness of fusions. But, said Zulamy, if Hamlin's mail dropped below five complimentary letters a week, he began to worry that his popularity was correspondingly dropping. <laughs> so she had a scheme. In times of appreciative flood, she would prevent his seeing a few of the best letters, especially ones with some such vague date as Tuesday, and feed these to Hamlin discreetly when gloom threatened to set in through a dirt fan mail. <laughs> Feeling out of step with current literary culture and how preoccupied with his past as he composed his literary reminiscences, and in some measure attempting to justify his place in American letters, Garland also took up a renewed interest in psychic investigation and enthusiasm of his Boston years. A number of reminiscences common in Garland's psychic pursuits, ranging from those like that of Harold Latham, who believed that Garland remained a skeptic to the end, but a skeptic with an open mind, to those who patiently listened to Garland relate his investigations and then avoided them, even though our conscience is burned, as uh, the writer Paul George Smith recalled. Uh, and here is Garland with his psychic uh, Sophie Williams uh, investigating his uh, most curious uh, hobby and the subject of his last book, The Mystery of the Buried Crosses. He believed that a psychic, through his psychic, he was hearing the voices of the founding uh, Spanish Padres of California, and also incidentally some of his closest friends who had now passed on, and that they were leading him to these buried objects where the metallic crosses. And what thrilled Garland is if, if he heard voices and found the crosses, he would now have physical proof that the spirit survived death. And of course, he's in the 70s and he's looking forward to some kind of confirmation that there will be something elsewhere. So he had this uh, psychic, Sophia Williams, and devised an elaborate test to measure her truth. There she is with a shovel. They're going to dig up some crosses. And the result is published in the book, The Mystery of Your Crosses. But, also, but Garland also had fun with his psychic uh, obsession. When he bought his first car with the proceeds of the sale of an article on the subject, he named it the Spook. Const, daughter Constance painted it on the side. Just as he named his cat Ectoplasm. <laughs> And when journalist, so he had a sense of humor about this. When journalist Floyd Logan visited in 1938, he brought along a new camera. It was a 35 millimeter type, which was soon to be identified as a candid camera, Logan recalled. I explained to the old gentleman what a good lens it had, how much faster the film was than most contemporary cameras used, and of the precision focusing it supported. His lively eyes took in everything. He stroked his mustache thoughtfully. Then he flung a good question at me. Can you take a spook's picture with that? <laughs> All the time I had been with him, I tried to preserve an atmosphere of keeping quiet myself so I could better listen to him. But this was a question where speech was of no use to me. I did not have an answer. I had never tried to photograph a ghost. Carlin was then busy with the manuscript of 40 years of psychic research. What he would have liked for me to do was to be with him when he had a medium corner who proposed to face him with an act of spook and he wanted to photograph his spirit, if any. I told him rather dryly as I looked back at the conversation 
that I doubted an ectoplasmic substance would register on my film, fast I knew it to be, but not quick enough to stop a spirit in transit. He looked disappointed. Yeah, yeah the idea of spirit photographs, not so far-fetched. Here's one. This is from the book The Mystery of Bear Crosses. This is a photograph that the person who turned them on to these crosses, a woman named Violet Parent, had these photos of spirits. Robin thought these were real. They looked like dolls to me. But <laughs> there's, there's still a group of people who believe these exist. I've been in correspondence with a, uh, the editor of a parapsychology journal who is convinced that this is true. And when I showed him the pictures, I said, how can this be? He says, you don't understand how ectoplasmic photographs work. And it goes on and on. But there are true believers out there. Uh, and here are the crosses themselves. This is uh, uh, Garland's granddaughter uh, arranged to loan them to, uh, uh, to Garland outfit in West Salem, Wisconsin. And uh, during one of my visit there, I got a chance to, to touch them and look at them. And I spread them out on a dishcloth for a quarter down to get an idea of size. And they're just old chunks of metal. Of singular importance to this volume of reminiscences is an earnest man named Eldon Hill, here he is in middle age, who as a 23-year-old graduate student initiated an extensive correspondence with Garland, who had become the subject of his PhD thesis, the first on Garland, completed in 1940, here Garland died, as a biographical study of Hamlet Garland from 1860 to 1895 at Ohio State University. For 11 years, beginning in 1929, Hill peppered Garland with letters as he traced the writer's accomplishments, visited him several times, and made extensive diary notes about his visits. He also wrote to a number of Garland's contemporaries to verify details of Garland's achievements. Garland was flattered by Hill's attention, <clears throat> which came at a time when Garland believed the public had lost interest in him. It's a source of encouragement, Garland wrote to Hill in February 1929, to have one of the younger men so genuinely interested in my work. I'm grateful. By 1934, Garland was routinely addressing his letters to my dear young advocate, then replying carefully and often in detail to Hill's many questions about phases in Garland's career. But Garland cautioned Hill against relying too heavily upon him. Don't send me any of your manuscript to me, he wrote to Hill. If I read it, I shall be accused of trying to revise it. I prefer to have you go ahead and say just what comes to your mind. Garland had also by then noticed Hill's tendency toward hero worship. In one of his diary notes, he's in uh, Garland's summer home, Grey Ledge, and he writes, I am, in a sense, on holy ground. <laughs> Here were written back trailers of middle border. <laughs> So he recognized his tendency toward hero worship and uncritical acceptance of everything he said. Don't be afraid or encounter to my judgments, he warned him. You must do so in order to have the proper balance in your paper. Give your honest reactions, no matter how uncomplimentary they may seem to my readers. Hill visited Garland several times for interviews, and Garland was initially flattered by the attention, but he soon became weary of hearing Hill's questions. I began to feel the burden of Hill's observation he provided to his diary in July 1936. He is so ceaselessly alert to catch something important falling from my lips that I dislike his eagerness. Worn out by Hill's visit, Carlin complained the next day, he eyed me so closely and asked so many questions that I grew restless under it. It bored me. The longer he stayed, the harder it was to talk with him. I felt that I was being perpetually interviewed, and worst of all, I lost confidence in the little man. I doubt if he ever does anything worthwhile as material. Hill apparently is small in stature. After Hill completed his dissertation, he embarked on a full-scale biography of Garland. In 1950, he placed an announcement of his intent to the New York Times and asked to hear from people who had known Garland. He received a good number of replies from many noted critics and writers, as well as detailed memoirs from Garland's brother Franklin and Franklin's wife Alice. These letters are of singular importance in the revelations of the effects of Garland's personality upon others as well as of his eccentricities, because they don't exist in most of the published remarks. And indeed, many of what I've read are those personal reminiscences. The overriding impression 
conveyed by these reminiscences is that of a writer whose strong personality repelled some, but whose generosity and spirit, his enjoyment of life, also compelled admiration. The biographer and historian Herman Hagedorn summed it up well. I was living in Pasadena the year that he died. There was for him, as Garland, happily, no period of gradual eclipse painful to him, his family, and his friends. But I remember of those final months is the undiminished vigor of his mind and body, the robust heartiness of his welcome when I went to see him, his keen interest in life, and in all that was important to his friends, the impression he gave unconsciously that he was going to be around for another decade anyway. The news of his death, when it came with no warning, would not register at first. It seemed unbelievable that a man so definitely still standing in the fullness of life could thus go between one day and the next. Thank you.